our students before they make their introductions to welcome you all back to campus and for this extraordinary event. It's a particular honor for me that we are able to open the year with this speaker. Iowa State University is home to so many of you who are engaged in research and work that is not only of tremendous service to the state, but also to the world. For you, Dr. Farmer is an inspiration to continue your pursuits. And for those of you just beginning your studies here, be grateful that you are able to hear from a man whose life has been one of the most incredible accomplishments while working with the sickest and poorest among us. His research and example benefits us all. Good evening. I am Abhishek Vemuri, co-chair of the World Affairs Series Planning Committee. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this evening's lecture, which is a part of the World Affairs Series. This annual series, which began 45 years ago as the Institute on World Affairs, brings scholars, practitioners, politicians, and activists to campus to speak on topics of international interest. It works with the University Committee on Lectures and is funded by the government of the student body. I'd like to ask the student and faculty members of the World Affairs Planning Committee and the Committee on Lectures to stand and be recognized for making Dr. Paul's visit, Dr. excuse me, Dr. Paul Farmer's visit possible tonight. We are thankful for their persistent efforts to bring Dr. Farmer to campus. Turn. Good evening. I'm Claire Wandro, and I'm Abhishek's co-chair on the World Affairs Series Planning Committee. Um, we would also like to recognize the many, many other student organizations that have contributed to tonight's event. The long list is a testament to the honorable work Dr. Farmer and his team at Partners in Health conduct. Would the student groups please stand and be recognized as I name them? Activists, the Anthropology Club, Black Graduate Student Association, Design Across Boundaries, Engineers Without Borders, Engineers for a Sustainable World, Freshman Council, Graduate Professional and Student Senate, EOS, the International Agriculture Club, the Pre-Medical Club, Student Union Board, the One Campaign, UNICEF, World Affairs, and the Committee on Lectures, funded by, the G by GSB, the government of the student body. So would you all please stand? And thank you, too, to the many academic units co-sponsoring tonight's event, including the Department of Anthropology, Bioethics Program, College of Agricultural and Life Sciences, College of Business, College of Design, College of Engineering, College of Human Sciences, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, College of Veterinary Medicine, George Gund Lecture Fund, Honors Program, Office of the Vice President for Student Affairs, Department of Sociology, as well as Des Moines University and Mary Greeley Medical Center. Before we introduce tonight's speaker, we would like to invite you to the many and more than 40 additional events already scheduled for the fall. The full schedule, co-sponsored by the Committee on Lectures, is available at the Iowa State Lectures Program website. And this year, we're having speakers like the Chicago Tribune column, columnist, Clarence Page, Mythbusters Grant Imahara, and World Food Prize Laureate Pedro Sanchez. We think you'll find that there's truly something for everyone. And now it's a true honor for me to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Paul Farmer. Dedicating his life to improving health care for the world's poorest people, Dr. Paul Farmer is a founding director of Partners in Health. The international nonprofit organization provides direct health care services, research, and advocacy on behalf of those who are sick and live in poverty. It has changed the practice of public health throughout the world, successfully treated drug-resistant tuberculosis, and created a model for teaching hospitals in destitute villages from Haiti to Rwanda. He has written extensively about health and human rights. His most recent book is Haiti After the Earthquake. 
Dr. Farmer also is a chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School, chief of the Division of Global Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, and United Nations Deputy Special Envoy for Haiti under Special Envoy Bill Clinton. Dr. Farmer's many honors include a MacArthur Genius Award, the Margaret Mead Award from the American Anthropological Association, the Carter Award for Humanitarian Contributions to the Health of Humankind from the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases, the Salk Institute Medal for Health and Humanity, the Outstanding International Physician Award from the American Medical Association, and with his partners and health colleagues, the Hilton Humanitarian Prize. While these awards are indeed reflect the incredible work Dr. Farmer has done over the years, they are also a testament to the powerful example he sets for us. His accomplishments should inspire us not just to reflect on our role in the global community, but to take action. It's a challenge we accept. Now, would you please all help me in welcoming Dr. Paul Farmer? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> if, if this had been a straw poll, I, I would have won the presidency of the United States. <laughs> Take that, Mitt Romney. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out tonight. <clears throat> Don't you have anything better to do? Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. This is my first trip to Ames, and I've asked that the lights be up a little bit so that I can see you. And, um, and this will be <clears throat> a presentation that I'm going to focus a lot on Haiti because that's what I was invited to speak about. Uh, but I did want to mention that uh, I'm lucky enough to work, as, as Abhishek said, uh, with a very large, Sarah Claire perhaps, with a very large team. And any time I say the word I, I really mean we, not the royal we, but I'm lucky enough to work with many thousands of people now. Um, it was Abish Abhishek who said uh, this is a challenge and we accept that. And that has been my experience too with uh, people who are students now, most of you are students, um, who are very uh, interested in the kind of topics that I'm going to be speaking about tonight and who understand that when we say global health, we're not just talking about international health. Um, Ames, Iowa is on the globe too, as, as we're reminded every four years or so, by the way, in this country. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I know your generation uh, of students uh, understands that. So it's actually a real privilege for me to, to be here talking uh, to students here. Now let me just met, start by mentioning what I'm not going to talk about tonight, although I'd be glad to in the question and answer uh, session and, we, and we'll uh, and take off my watch. All professors do that, but it actually means nothing. Yeah, I'll be, I, I will keep my comments brief. I should, we should be done by uh, 11 or so, and then, and then I'll sign your books. Um, but this is, this is a, a map of the places that uh, my colleagues and I in Partners in Health work in. What you see here are um, a dozen countries. What you don't see um, are, of course, the people who do the work, um, but also their partners. And in, in my case, for example, I'm lucky enough to be a volunteer for Partners in Health because I have a job at a, at a research university, a small community-based college in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And, uh, and so you don't see the partnerships, really. And that's why when 27 years ago, when we were students, really your age, many of you, um, we started Partners in Health. We called it Partners in Health because we understood uh, that partnerships are critical to attacking really complex problems. Health disparities are, so, are such a problem. Food security is another. I've met people already here today who I think would have a lot to add to the kind of work we're doing on food security. Water security, uh, we, in, in areas that I know very little about, but I know we need to understand climate change, what's happening to the, the, the planet we're, we're living on. And, and uh, these are the partnerships that underpin our work in healthcare. So I'm going to focus on Haiti, but again, I'd be glad to talk about our work in, some, in, in, in Africa or Siberia or Latin America. Um, but a lot of the lessons that we've learned in Haiti have proven applicable elsewhere, including the United States. So I mentioned already that the United States is on the globe. Uh, Partners in Health also works in, in the Boston area, 
Also with the Navajo Nation, we have colleagues working there. And health disparities um, are really everywhere that I've ever been, we see health disparities. What I mean by that is some people at great risk for illness, premature illness, suffering and death, and others shielded from that risk. And really one of the things that we try to do is make that gap less. And one of the ways we do that, of course, is by bringing the fruits of science and technology um, to bear on health care problems of people living in poverty. Now that's easy to say, and I'll show you some of the work that we've done that's been very positive. I also want to talk about, candidly, about um, that earthquake and what it revealed to us about how we were not prepared, uh, we as Partners in Health, we as the Haitian Ministry of Health, we as the international community, not prepared for that kind of shock to, to the, uh, an already chronically weakened system. I'll talk about that too. So let me start by, um, and this is, uh, I'm still looking for an earlier picture than this, but I, uh, and again, forgive me for addressing the students. Um, I know there are people who are not students here, at least I'm guessing that not all of you are students. Uh, but I started this work, as I said, at, uh, at a dinner tonight with a group of students and faculty. I started, I got involved in this as an undergraduate. And the, this, again, being Haiti, global health, medical anthropology, or anthropology, which was mentioned, and medicine. All of that um, I owe uh, in large part to having been uh, at an American university um, where I could shop around. This was Duke University where I went, went to college where I could really learn and shop around. And when I was a uh, sophomore, um, I was a biochemistry major. I had a great mentor um, I had identified. So even as a junior, I was still pursuing this and, and thought that I wanted to uh, study biochemistry and medicine. And then I took a class called medical anthropology. And the reason I took the class, I'm sure you can all guess, is because it had the word medical in it. I took medical ethics. I would take anything. I knew I wanted to be a doctor. And I was so enchanted with the material, um, with what we were reading and what we heard about in class, uh, that I uh, eventually changed my major uh, to anthropology and have pursued that ever since, along with medicine. So I, I'm, I'm really telling you that story so that you'll be open um, to, um, and, and as, as your teachers would want you to be, your faculty would want you to be, be open to um, new experiences. And then, of course, I, that's what led me um, to Haiti, and, but I'll tell you a little bit about that as well. The year I graduated in 1982. I'm kind of embarrassed to say that because almost none of you were even born in 1982. Um, <clears throat> I should, I'm going to have to start telling you what a, a telephone landline looks like or a television. Very old school. In, 19, uh, in 1982, when I graduated, I had gotten interested in Haiti and Haitians because I, I was writing for a student publication. I'm just wondering, how many of you have ever written for a student newspaper publication? So some, some of you. The rest of you need to work on your literacy, hone your literacy skills. But I, I uh, did an investigative piece uh, on migrant farm worker conditions uh, in North Carolina. And I met a lot of Haitians. And I, and I had learned, I, I, I spoke French, but I realized that they didn't speak French. I couldn't understand they, them, and they couldn't understand me. And I said, I really, I want to go to Haiti and learn how to speak Haitian Creole. Some of you here in this room, I'm sure, are, are Haitian and speak Haitian Creole, and some few others will as well. And I ended up in central Haiti um, in a town called Mirabale. And remember that name, M-I-R-E-B-A-L-A-S, Mirabale, um, because it will come up again at the end of my comments. Uh, by the way, wherever the student body president is, he asked me at dinner to make sure and talk about what students can do. So I'm reconfiguring my speech for you because um, I'm following instructions. I take instruction well. And uh, I went to this town, Mirabale. Of course, I was 20. I, I, I just turned 23, I think. And uh, I didn't really know what I was doing, of course. But I was open and eager and wanted to work uh, with Haitians. And I ended up meeting some people in central Haiti. And I still work with them to this day, those that, that are still uh, alive. It's almost three decades ago. Some of them are no longer with us. And I started working in what was called a clinic. Uh, and it was terrible. The conditions were terrible. Now, that's not what a good guest says, because I was a guest in that country. I'm still a guest. I, you know, you know, I don't go to the person I was working with who, um, who had set up the clinic, who, who was not a physician, um, or to the physician for that matter, there was a physician, and say, you know, this is really 
very poor quality care we're, de we're delivering. After all, I hadn't even started medical school. But I knew it was poor quality care. And he knew, the physician knew, and all of us knew this was not good enough. And that's probably when I decided that I would make this my life's work, and many others, again, as Abhishek said, are interested in doing this. And again, it doesn't, you don't have to be a doctor to do this work. We needed help in the pharmacy. We needed help in design of the clinic. We needed to, basically, we needed to tear the thing down and, and start again. And that's how we ended, I ended up going to this village, which I, I am, uh, I'm here with one of my colleagues, and this is, I'm going to say in front of her, I've got to find a, a picture from that year. I'm sure I could find some. There were no buildings on the top of this hill except for huts when we went there because it was a squatter settlement. And some of you uh, enterprising students will have actually read um, some of the books I've written about this and, and know that why this squatter settlement was formed. And that is because a hydroelectric dam that was billed as a development project flooded the valley where these people live. And you can see in the background, you can see the reservoir. I don't know. Can you see the reservoir? Not if yes. One if by land, two if by sea. Back in the background. So they went up into the highlands, and they were very difficult. Uh, these highlands are, were denuded, no trees anymore, not a lot of soil, and they were having a hard time of it, as you might imagine. And this was just one difficult community among many in Haiti and in the world. And again, I didn't understand all this then. I didn't understand the difference between global health and international health because there was no global health movement at the time. 1983? 84? Not really. But we, again, we knew that we could try again and to build a better clinic, and we did. We built a clinic, and it was better than the one in the other town, which was at that point, because the road wasn't paved about an hour and a half away, it was better than the clinic in Mirbalé. But it really wasn't good still. And in the 20, quarter century since then, that's a lot of what we've done in Haiti, is try to improve the quality of the infrastructure, of the training, and of the of course of the services we deliver. And that should sound familiar to people at a university. That is, that's what universities do, is there, and this university especially is called to do this by its charter, uh, to link research and teaching to service, to things that are useful. And I don't think we should impose that kind of mandate on every academic body, right? You wouldn't want someone to, you know, wallow into the philosophy department and say, you guys show us that you're useful. Are there any philosophy department people here? <laughs> I think there, you know, it's a mistake to try and bend every, you know, you know, every aesthetic or intellectual endeavor to utilitarian ends. I'm not uh, advocating that. And, but I think in medicine and public health, that's what we're supposed to do. So this experience uh, of development also was a really great thing for me because I got to see, in, not only in a book, and. And I, I said to Claire, um, who's a senior, I, I was saying when, uh, on our way to dinner uh, that I thought it's a good thing to take a year after college before you go on to pursue graduate study. Um, I even threatened to write her parents an email. Don't worry, Claire, I won't do that. But um, I, that the reason is because my own experience uh, of being coming engaged in these questions as a student in a college, in the middle of nowhere, by the way. You think Ames is isolated, try living in a forest, the Duke Forest. Um, really, it's a university in the middle of the woods, and there are a lot of those. A, those islands are like that are good places to be, and I'm, I couldn't, I'm so grateful, as I said, to have been started on this path then. But going to Haiti really opened my eyes to, eyes to the, a lot of the complexity. So development. The development complexity here is obvious. Here is a development project, but I got to see it from the eyes of people who regarded themselves as the victims of the project. They lost their land, and as they said rather bitter, bitterly in interview after interview, we lost our land to a hydroelectric dam, and we got neither electricity nor water. So I understood that bitterness, uh, and it was a good way, not a pleasant way, but a really good way to learn about the underside of any endeavor like this. And I think it's taught me caution, uh, and I'm very much involved in these kind of endeavors still to this day, as I'll show you. So that was the beginning for me, and it changed the kind of medicine I wanted to pursue. And again, I'm still working in the same village, although it looks very different now, as you might imagine. Um, first of all, the deforestation problem. 
Deforestation is a huge problem in Haiti and, the, and underpins all of the ecological fragility that we see there now. Not all of it, but most of it, to a storm, and I'll show you some examples later on. But that, you know, it's not, this is the same area now, reforested. Um, and that's, that's in a quarter century. Uh, we didn't know how to do it. I mean, we started planting trees. I mean, that's actually a good way to tackle deforestation is to actually plant trees. I mean, you can wait till, you know, God sows them again for you, but it takes a little bit longer. And we, you know, it was, a, it was an amateurish endeavor, but it wasn't as amateurish an endeavor as the, the, the dam because it was a lot more of what we call in medicine the do-no-harm approach. Um, we, we, we knew we weren't going to hurt anybody by planting trees. We didn't always plant the right trees or enough trees, but the, the idea that you can't tackle problems like these. Now I've mentioned several problems. Deforestation, the lack of health care, the lack of education. You, you tackle those by putting in place infrastructure and staff capable of addressing health care and educational needs and then also obviously um, responding to the specific the problem. And we'll go back to that um, thinking about the earthquake. So there, I want to just say before turning to medicine and health care that my own experience in Haiti has been really quite positive. Uh, and I'm sure others um, in this auditorium have also had positive experiences in Haiti. And uh, I'm, I'm only saying that because you'll hear again and again that you can't get anything done in Haiti, and that's not been my experience. And I'm going to go now to talk as a physician. This is a, a before and after picture. I, I actually showed it last, last night. They're very good pictures, I think. I didn't take them. They were taken by a student of mine who's now a colleague, uh, a faculty member at Harvard Medical School. He's from Chicago, which is a city not too far north of here, I'm told. Um, anyway, when he was a student, he, he took a fifth year. Medical school lasts four years usually, but a lot of students, maybe half of them, take a fifth year at Harvard. And he came to Haiti for the year. He'd been going there every year since his first year. But now he was much more experienced, and he went off to another town, not the place I was living, but another town about an hour and a half, two hours away. And I'll show you a picture of it later, of a hospital we built there, uh, to a con town called Las Calvas. And... Um, I, we had it put in place, again, if you have communication projects, no telephone lines, what would your generation say? If you don't have a telephone line, what do you use instead? Cell phone and, and internet, right? Satellites. That's why God created satellites, to increase the ease of communication. I mean, listen, if the political candidates come here and talk about God, I can too. Um, <laughs> So we put in, we put in, we put in, uh, in the internet in all these sites, and that was our means of communicating. So I got an email from my student, um, whose name is David, and he wrote and said, well, you know, Paul, we'd like you to come and see this patient. He's a 26-year-old man. He has AIDS and tuberculosis, and, you know, he's wasted and really skinny, and I made the mistake of writing back and saying, oh, I'd be glad to, but why do you need me to say to see him. I mean, you guys are pros at what you were talking about, David and the Haitians he was working with. Now, if I had been in Iowa, one of my students would have written back and said, because you're the greatest infectious disease doctor in the world. But at Harvard, no. He had to make a smart alecky response. He said, well, we want you to come because we want you to cheer the patient up. And then I wrote back on the email. This is before texting. It would have been worse. I wrote back and said, what am I, clowns without borders? Now, that's a true story, and I made the mistake of telling it in New York in an auditorium recently, and someone came up to me afterwards and said, we're from Clowns Without Borders, and we wish you'd stop. <laughs> so I hope that this is not being taped and, or being s sent off into the Internet and get me in trouble with the Clowns Without Borders. Um, because, you know, people need to be cheered up. But I thought after, you know, 30 years of training, I might be expected to provide infectious disease care. Anyway, this is a before and after picture. You understand that, right? Same guy. Joseph is his name. And uh, he's, this is many years ago. He's still, I saw him not too long ago in, the, in his hometown. And, you know, you have one or two experiences like this as a physician, you know, seeing people come back from the dead. Uh, it really changes your life. What, if, what about if you have thousands of patients like that? And that's what we do in, in, with Partners in Health. Yes, we have individual doctors, nurses, health workers, psychologists, community health workers, rather. Um, but we also are trying to build programs and systems. And there are a lot of people at this university who study systems. And I think 
That's what we need more of in healthcare in general in the United States or anywhere is how can we build systems that protect people, safety nets, pe so that someone like Joseph doesn't have to wander around for months and even years dying of two diseases for which there is treatment. One disease can be cured, tuberculosis, the other one can be treated. So he got into a system, and that's, I think that's why he's still alive today, is because he, you know, he's in a system. He has a community health worker. He knows where to go if he doesn't feel well. And he's had other problems since then, right? He's, he's had another case of, uh, of TB, drug-resistant TB. So it, it's, not, it's not that he's out of the woods. None of us are, you know? Um, as far as I know, every person in this room will eventually one day die. I hate to break that to you at 18 or 19. But there's a system here to take care of him as there is to take care of us. Anyway, this little uh, uh, obscure diagram on the side, I'll just mention very briefly what it is, what it is uh, to remind me that how systems are built is not an easy thing. How health systems are built, very complex, takes a lot of time. How new programs are built, it's very, you know, very hard to do. H, the HEI is the HIV Equity Initiative, right? So that was what we started in Haiti to take care of these patients. But then we had to find funding for it, which wasn't easy to do. Partners in Health was carrying a heavy load back then because to the, buy these drugs was very expensive. It is not expensive now, but it was then. Uh, and we needed funding. And uh, a, a group called FOCALA, uh, associated with the Open Society Institute, gave us our first grant. I remember it was $100,000 which for us was a large grant. It was the largest grant actually that they'd made in Haiti ever. And they were focused on educational activities, but they, they knew this was the right thing to do. They support us. And then we grew that program and system by working with colleagues to develop consensus around how to integrate HIV prevention and care. Um, and also by really in a way lobbying, I don't know if that's the right term, but pushing um, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, various and sundry academics to come together to, um, to build a new response to what had become the ranking infectious killer of young adults in the world, AIDS. And there was no program before the Global Fund, GFATM means Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. Um, and PEPFAR is a U.S. government's plan, the Bush administration's plan, which is President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Those two uh, systems and funding programs really change global health very dramatically, in my view, for the better. And they're, they're really the reason that not only that so many people living with HIV in, place, in places in Africa, for example, where I've been working uh, for the last six years, that's why they're still alive, but it's also why a lot of health systems have been built in places that hadn't known them before. So these are, these are programs of problems, sure, you know, any big program like this, Ambitious Endeavor, has its problems, but they also are programs with a lot of promise. So I encourage you to, to all of you, I didn't even say thank you properly, by the way, to all the student organizations and uh, all those who made my talk possible. I should have started by saying that, but th these uh, endeavors are also well worth your support. Now, what does that mean for health systems? I mean, it's, it's one thing to show you a picture of a patient before and after, but let me show you some institutions before and after. So this is, uh, uh, what do I do? Did I point this at, there we go. I think I'll point this at you. And say, yeah. So this is a, an, abandoned, uh, an abandoned set of buildings in a town called Bukankare. And I can tell you, I had never, I'd only been to Bukankare once or twice before 2003. And the reason was that it was a, an area that was cut off from the rest of central Haiti a couple months a year by uh, a river that flooded and took a lot of lives with it too. I mean, imagine if you have, have what's called obstructed labor. If you're about to have a baby and you're caught on the wrong side of that river and you can't deliver the baby, that's obstructed labor, of course, how are you going to get across? Uh, and, and I say that because I, you know, even three years ago, two women and their, and their unborn children lost their lives trying to cross that river. So one of the things that we finally uh, we're happy to see happen was a bridge was put in. That's another story, um, the story of the bridge. But this is, uh, this is what I meant by a before and after of an institution. This is not a beautiful hospital, but it's the after of those abandoned buildings. And what we did was we took money that was labeled as AIDS money for these AIDS projects. Um, 2003 was the first year that the Global Fund dispersed money into Haiti 
which is one of the earlier grants. And we used that money to strengthen health systems. And we complemented it, of course, with other funds, um, which we could do because Partners in Health was raising uh, so-called unrestricted funds to rebuild that abandoned, those abandoned facilities into a hospital. Not a great hospital, but still uh, a hospital nonetheless. And in fact, if you were to go there now, five years later, and I, I, did, I, I was back there a couple years ago, or maybe right after the bridge was uh, put in place, the fall of 2009, I think, I, I was turned around. I was confused about where I was because it was so confusing because there was now solar power on every building, trees everywhere. So it even looked different from 2003. It was uh, radically transformed. And there were other things going on too, a tilapia hatchery, uh, some agricultural, sustainable agricultural projects, etc. So this breaking this cycle of poverty and disease for us in this area meant putting in place medical infrastructure. But we also knew that health care, I mean, education needed to be strengthened, access to credit for farmers, access to tools, seed, um, at, you know, all of these things need to be done, if preferably at the same time if possible. And I have seen that happen again and again. Again, this is a, a positive story uh, about Haiti. Let me just show you the map of our, pro first, by the way, before I do, this is the hometown of Joseph, the guy whose picture I showed you. We actually went in and built a new hospital the hospital we built in 2002 uh, was like the one you just saw, a revision of an existing facility that we added on a, a floor to and some space. But this is, we decided to build a hospital ourselves. So we figured out over the course of a year, I'm sorry, a decade, how to build healthcare infrastructure. It's not a perfect hospital, but it's, we're getting better at it. And then after the earthquake, as I'll show you, we had to learn how to get better still. So this is the map of the progress. Um, and I, again, we here is a group that kept on expanding from a few hundred people to a few thousand people. Now there are probably between five and 6,000 people working for Partners in Health or with Partners in Health in its sister organization, which is called Zami da Sante, which means Partners in Health in Creole. And 99% of them are, of course, Haitian. Uh, most of them community health workers, and many of them, most of them, I believe, have never had a job before. So this is also a, uh, an, you know, also a good way to to uh, employ people. Now, there are all kinds of discussions that we can have and will have, if you'd like, about you know, sustainability. I'm you know, certainly pushed to uh, argue that this is a sustainable project again and again and again, which gets wearing after a while. But it is an important discussion to have. But from the Dominican border all the way to the coast uh, of, on, of Haiti on the western side, uh, everywhere there's a red dot. Partners in Health, sister organization, uh, had gone in and done the same process of rebuilding or building medical infrastructure, training local people, and delivering services. And we learn lessons on the way. Again, that's back to the, the feedback loop of research. We learn lessons. Sometimes we do formal surveys, asking questions like, what's the how do you best deliver certain regimens um, for chronic disease? Or maybe we'd ask, how can we promote food security? Or how much food insecurity is there among our patients? How about people who are not our patients, who live in the same villages? Lots of questions can be asked uh, and answered and, and shared with others. I was, yesterday, I was in a, I won't mention what city because you'll be upset, but it does involve Hawkeyes. Um, but I met uh, a student there, a third year medical student, who had been working, I mean, it's not her fault, she's in Iowa City, okay? Be humane. She had been working in Mozambique uh, for two years, and she told me that sh what she found most useful in her time there was the information that Partners in Health had posted on its website to share in an open source manner the lessons that we learned with other groups. And I was very gratifying to hear that, as you might imagine, uh, because it, it was a reminder here in, in Iowa that when you share information like this, a lot of good things can come out of it, which was our intention all along. So this was where we were on the eve of the uh, earthquake. We were some thousands of people um, working together. We also were working, as you saw, in a number of other countries. As I didn't talk about uh, our work in Africa, but I will tell you right now that when we went to Africa after 2004, uh, to Rwanda, Malawi, Lesotho, and then later in, a, with, in Burundi with an, uh, another 
a partner organization. When we went there, of course, we had a lot of expertise in our Haitian staff, uh, and the Haitians went with us to Africa to help launch this kind of, these kind of projects there as well. Very gratifying decade of work, I would say. And, but none of us were ready for the earthquake. Uh, we had I had personally just left Haiti with my family and, uh, you know, and, and feeling that things were pretty calm just then. And after the, it was the Christmas of 2009, we spent the holidays there. And, uh, and I, none of us, I mean, if you were a seismologist, I guess there are seismologists who said, well, we knew it was going to happen. They said that after the earthquake, I might add. But I, I, I would not have, after the, the floods of 2008 due to hurricanes, I thought I'd pretty much seen, seen what we were going to see. And that wasn't really the case. Um, it was uh, January 12th at uh, 4.53 in the afternoon, which is, you know, of course, a time of the day when people are at work or in school on a weekday. Uh, a a 7.0 uh, magnitude earthquake uh, hit right at the nerve center of Haiti, that is the capital city. And the United States has many great cities, large cities. Um, but Haiti has only one. It's the capital city. And a lot of countries in the world have these giant capital cities. Um, they don't have a New York or a Chicago. and a Miami. They have just one big city. And Haiti's, as you probably know, was particularly crowded and unsafe. We had no idea just how unsafe, how bad the building uh, quality of construction was until the earthquake. But this is, you know, this is a hundred-year-old palace. This is the National Palace. Um, and, you know, again, it wouldn't have occurred to me to interrogate the structural integrity of a hundred-year-old building. It might to an engineer from, from Ames or some other place, but it would not have occurred to me that, that this would all fall down. And to give a, uh, an example before I turn, to, turn back to healthcare professionals, um, and I mentioned this yesterday in the other town that I won't mention by name, that of the 29 or so federal buildings in Port-au-Prince, 28 of them uh, did not survive the earthquake. And that means the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Justice, the National Palace, all, all of it really uh, laid, laid low on that one day. This is the nursing school. The, and the nursing school, again, there's, there may be several nursing schools in Haiti, but there's only one public nursing school, the National University, and this is it. And as you can imagine, the students, the second year students were in the, in, in the building at the time along with their teachers. Very few of them survived the earthquake. And so that is a, a tragedy for every one of those mostly young women and their teachers. Also a tragedy for the country of Haiti because this is their main nursing school. And that's what it was with a lot of the professional schools. And as a healthcare professional, of course, that was one of uh, my chief concerns. It was my job to think of it. Actually, Partners in Health is the largest employer of Haitian doctors and nurses, probably, in the whole country. And so all of our staff were affected by this, as you might imagine. They all had family. Many of them lost family members. And they were really called on to do two things at once, to, to grieve or what, I think is a good enough word, but also to respond to the earthquake. And this is, this is what happened. And a number of people from Ames and elsewhere in Iowa, many, many people uh, came to Haiti and from this university uh, as well, and also raised money for earthquake relief. And, and I'd let, first, this is a chance for me to come out here and say thank you for that, but also to show you some of the things that were done, that I think were done fairly well after the earthquake. Now, first of all, one of the reasons we had so much difficulty inside Haiti appreciating the enormity of the problem. One of the reasons was that we were in the earthquake zone, right? So it's, you're in the middle of all of it. But also it was a very uh, substantial catastrophe or disaster as compared to other disasters with which you'll be familiar, like the Asian tsunami of 2004, in terms of lives lost, although the, all these numbers are contested, as you might imagine, uh, and also uh, property destroyed. And as I said, it hit the nerve center of the country. So that was part of the reason we're having trouble uh, organizing even our thoughts about what was going on. The other is that we were busy attending to the wounded. And that's one of the things that uh, Partners in Health did was to, um, again, use the, first of all, we had an enormous amount of support um, uh, donations um, that came in to Partners in Health. Uh, really, a lot of them through the website. 
Um, and I didn't even know that our website was set up that way so effectively. It had just been done in months before the earthquake, so it was really a good thing that, that we, and this is a pro bono um, uh, effort from a, a group called Blue State Digital. No offense if Iowa is not a blue state. I, I'm not, I already said I wouldn't talk about politics. Uh, but this is a, a group that donated services in the fall of 2009 to Partners in Health to improve our uh, interface, uh, our, our web connection. And it's a good thing that that uh, was done. Uh, because not only did we receive a lot of support, we also were able to put up appeals for the kind of help we needed, which was largely surgical, trauma care, et cetera. And, uh, and we had, uh, I never knew how many Americans had planes, by the way. Are you aware how many Americans have planes? It was, I w never thought I would be celebrating that, by the way. I, I, a student, at, I gave a talk at MIT about the earthquake a few months ago, and a student came up. I think she's, no, she didn't have the courtesy even to come up to me and say it. She said, uh, in a big auditorium like this, she said, well, you know, you're always saying that we need more equity in the world, and here you are celebrating people with planes. I thought there was a little bit of a harsh critique, actually. Anyway, people helped us move personnel, supplies, um, by the plane load into Haiti. And of course, the, commercial, the airport was closed to commercial traffic for many months. It was damaged. And, uh, and this was a very, um, uh, it was, I, mean, I was going to say it was a very beautiful thing. I don't think people living in Haiti or the Haitians affected thought anything about the earthquake was beautiful. But there was something very moving and noble about the number of people who came to help and the competence with which the relief was provided. Now, this is not re Reconstruction. I'm not going to give such a positive review yet of Reconstruction, but of the actual relief. And here's a, another image of this ungainly boat that is actually back in Haiti right now, just came in last week. It's called the U.S. Naval Ship The Comfort and ha it brought into play on day eight about 12 more operating rooms and a huge number of skilled health professionals on, on board this ship. We were very grateful for it. Um, now, most of the rescuing was not done by, you know, the, these military helicopters, which, again, were incredibly valuable to us. Most of the rescuing was done, of course, by the Haitians, by neighbors helping neighbors. And that's something we also need to remember is that, you know, we can see more clearly, and you can see more clearly from here, the impact of the kind of support that we had from the United States and elsewhere in the world, people from all over, from Cuba, China, across uh, Latin America, Asia, Europe, people came from all over. But a lot of Haitians helped each other out too, which is again a very encouraging uh, thing. Now, what about Reconstruction? Uh, reconstruction, not going so well yet. Now, I don't know how this would compare to Reconstruction, say, of New Orleans after Katrina. Um, when I was writing this book uh, last year, um, I was trying to figure out, and this is one of the reasons I, I write it all, is to try and think more clearly. Well, how does the pace of Reconstruction compare to the pace of Reconstruction elsewhere? It turns out it's very hard to know. First of all, as I said, this was an enormous catastrophe compared to other ones. It struck a very weak place. And the metaphor I use in this book is a medical metaphor, acute, uh, acute on chronic, that is, when someone has a chronic ailment like, uh, like uh, diabetes, if they have an acute problem like pneumonia, it's not always the same clinical course. Other interventions are needed. And that's how it is in my, I'm a doctor, so of course I'd use medical metaphors, but that's what's going on in Haiti too. Problems like housing were chronic problems already. Problems like food security, education. Before the earthquake, only half of all school-aged children in Haiti were in school. So you can imagine the challenge after the earthquake to get, not only get people back in school, get, get people more in school. And the housing problem, which I'll turn to in a second, was already a very, very difficult nut to crack before then. Now we have on top of the housing, quite literally, rubble. And rubble, you know, uh, rubble removal, I had no idea that this, uh, other people who knew more about such disasters did have an idea. I, I, I remember the day of the earthquake, the night of the earthquake, President Clinton saying to, to me and to others that the biggest problem is going to be housing and rubble removal. And, and it was. And, you know, he should know, too. He was president of a fairly large country for two terms. And he was right. And this is what it looks like. Now, imagine trying to clear this stuff out by hand, which is what you see them doing here. It's going to take forever. So you need um, machinery to do this. 
But machinery downtown, remember this is all downtown in the, most, in the only si big city in Haiti. When, if you have machinery during the day, how are people going to do their work? And if you don't remove the rubble, how are they going to rebuild their homes and businesses? So I'm not suggesting that this is an easy thing to figure out. I'm just letting you know that the expertise that exists in the world either has not been to brought to bear fully on this problem or, as, or, or we still need to learn more about how to clear, clean up after a, da a disaster like this. And I say we again because it is a global community that was, has been responding to this, uh, to the earthquake in Haiti. We have a long way to go. I was asked uh, uh, by a radio um, journalist, uh, an NPR journalist, well, what, what grade would you give um, for our response to the earthquake? I said, well, I'd give two different grades, one for the direct relief, immediate relief uh, effort, and another one for reconstruction. I'd give, I'd probably give at least a B to the relief efforts. After all, a lot of people showed up. Not all of them prepared, many of them unprepared. But uh, the people tried really hard and a lot of lives were saved. For the reconstruction, I would give a very much, a very, uh, not a passing grade yet. But again, I, I'd like to learn more uh, about how rapidly this has been done elsewhere. I started to say that when I was writing this book, I was going from Boston to Rwanda to Haiti, and I make that trip a lot. Let me suggest to you that it's not a very pleasant trip. In fact, if there were a direct flight from Rwanda to Ames, I would come make this my home. But uh, thank you. <laughs> I'll lighten this up. You know, earthquakes are not very funny, but you've got to lighten it up. On my way uh, to Rwanda, after teaching a class at Harvard College, um, and Harvard Medical School, I, got on, I went to New York to c catch the flight to Europe and then Central Africa. And I, there was the New York Times. And th there was an editorial. It said, Katrina, five years later. I think that was the name of the editorial. And Katrina, five years later, in the text, which I put into the book, um, it said that New Orleans remains the most blighted city in the United States as far as housing goes. So clearly someone who's giving a grade to reconstruction on, uh, for reconstruction in New Orleans would also um, not give a high mark if it's the most blighted city in terms of housing in the United States because of, again, probably acute on chronic problems, the chronic problems that New Orleans had that were revealed by the acute event of Katrina. So again, I don't know how to grade rubble removal, but it's not good yet. And it can't be good if almost uh, 20 months out we still have only a quarter of it uh, quarter of it removed. Now let's go to the, the, as President Clinton predicted, the housing problem. First of all, the number of people displaced by the earthquake was enormous um, because there were about three million people in the city. Probably half of the people dr affected directly. A lot of them went back out into the rural areas and that, that's what happens. These are uh, cities that have grown up really over the last few decades. And everybody has roots, not everybody, but most people in Port-au-Prince, the capital, have roots in some other town outside of the capital city. But this is it. <coughs> this is what we saw, excuse me, um, more than people going out to the rural areas. What we saw was people going into open spaces that they felt were safe. So this is a, a, a former uh, landing strip for airplanes in the city, which was turned into a park with basketball courts, et cetera. And on top of this, within probably three or four days after the quake, there were tens of thousands of people there. And there, there may still be uh, 40 or 50,000 people living there to this day in this one camp. Now, I know this because Partners in Health, as the you know, largest providers of health care in rural Haiti, we had to ask some hard questions after the earthquake. What is our role in Port-au-Prince? We never had any clinical presence there. We hardly had an office there. Um, we were working in central and what's called Artibonite, Haiti, where there was very little in the way of medical infrastructure prior to the arrival of our of Partners in Health. Uh, most of it had been concentrated in Port-au-Prince. But we thought, well, we've got to do something. And our Haitian colleagues made this decision for us, as you might imagine. And they said, we need to go and have a medical presence in the displaced person's settlements. And we did. And those tents uh, in the foreground, you can see three tents. Those are uh, Partners in Health um, field hospital. Now, one of the things we also saw is scores of NGOs and relief workers coming in. But as you can imagine, most of them have left. And yet the people are still 
in these conditions. And so we haven't really been able to leave this place uh, because we're still finding huge need uh, in the IDP camps. It's now, IDP means internally displaced people, it's now estimated that uh, that number has gone from 1.3 million, that is a third of the city, living under tents or tarps or pieces of plastic, to uh, over 600,000. That's improvement, but it's still, you know, a huge number of displaced people. And uh, that's just in the city. I was there this week, and, uh, and I, someone had just met I think, I think they mentioned he was from Pakistan, who was, had come to Haiti. Or maybe he had worked in Pakistan after the earthquake. I think he was Pakistani. And he said, wow, it looks like there was just an earthquake here. Meaning, as in yesterday. And that's because he saw all the rubble and the displaced people. Now, those of us who've been there on and off for all those 20 months know that it doesn't look the same. A lot of the rubble has been cleared. A lot of people are moved back into safer or temporary housing. Um, some things are moving forward. I'm going to talk, close by talking about um, some of our own efforts in central Haiti to, to use President Clinton's term to build back better. But it is still looks very much like an earthquake zone. Now, uh, that's because, I said, uh, that these problems are acute and chronic. These are images, some of them, from uh, the, earth, the hurricanes. I've got to get my natural disasters straight here. You're familiar in this, in this state with flooding. Um, and flooding is a huge problem in Haiti for a different reason than flooding is a problem in Iowa. Flooding there is related, as I said, to deforestation. The hills have been denuded, and so in 2008, four hurricane, when four hurricanes struck Haiti in this many uh, weeks, uh, the whole cities were underwater. This is a city on the coast called Gonaive, and uh, it was underwater for weeks, downtown Gonaive. And again, I sh here you see, um, I, I think some of you will recognize this image, uh, the green and the, the forest on one side and the uh, treeless hills on the other. What, what border is that? That's Haiti in the Dominican Republic. Um, and that's what it looks like. I, I work on that border, so I, I know the, it's pretty shocking to, to fly over it, or even you can even tell from the ground. So these are problems that are going to require long-term commitment, obviously by the Haitian people and their chosen leadership, but by those who would accompany them uh, in rebuilding. And I use that word very um, guardedly, accompany. Um, it, it's, it's hard to know what strategy. I showed you, I started by talking about this development project that hurt the Haitian people, or at least hurt the people up in those hills, a development project, a hydroelectric dam. But hydroelectric dams can be great things. Right? They can, they can uh, make uh, fallow lands fertile. They can bring electricity without just damaging the environment. I'm a big hydroelectric dam fan. Uh, yeah, hydroelectric dam fan. Sounds like a fan inside the hydro. Let me think that again. I'm a fan of hydroelectric dams. But you want them to be pl uh, planned out carefully. And accompaniment is a, a term that we've been using in our work to describe that process of walking with someone or accompanying them on a trip. And, and, and again, this is something we could talk about uh, in the Q&A in the conversation. But none of these problems is going to be uh, you know, solved by a quick fix. It's really a long-term commitment to walking with the Haitian people as they try to address these problems. Uh, water security is another one. Um, and I'm showing you this picture. This is a post-quake image of the squatter settlements and also people lining up for water. I mean, what are they going to do inside a squatter settlement, right? They, they need to have water. It's not like they're going to drill their own wells. Um, and this report on water security, which was written by, among other groups, Partners in Health, uh, really says, look, if we don't have a plan to build strong public water systems in Haiti, the Haitian people will be exposed to risk of waterborne diseases, including cholera. And so in the spring after the earthquake, when some public health authorities said, well, it's very unlikely that cholera would ever show up in Haiti, we didn't agree at all. We thought, we hoped that it was true. But when the first cases occurred 10 months ago, um, we, we, uh, the first cases of, sorry, let me put that down there, of uh, explosive watery diarrhea. Last night, by the way, I said explosive watery diarrhea twice, just for fun, in front of a big crowd. And I was staying with some friends of mine, who I, well, a guy who went, I went to medical school, and his daughters were there. 
And I didn't get out of the place till about almost midnight. And my friends were waiting up for me to eat, have dinner at midnight. Here in Ames, they did it right. They fed me beforehand. Um, but anyway, they were waiting up for me. And I said, so what did the girls think? Did they enjoy it? And uh, my colleague, uh, who's uh, at Iowa, um, said, well, the, the one thing they loved the most was when you repeated explosive watery diarrhea. So if there are any young people here, explosive watery diarrhea three times. <laughs> but you know, in my line of work, in my line of work, is, there's not a lot of humor. You know, how much funny public health things can happen? But in any case, we, this was not a joke at all. We knew that this was a serious problem. And my colleague who called me, I was in Rwanda that day again, got a call from my uh, colleague Louise Ivers, who's an infectious disease doctor. She said, we think it's going to be cholera. And it was. And uh, I apologize for repeating this term, but I, in the book I said it exploded in Haiti like a bomb. And that was because, of course, the water insecurity was so profound. People did not have safe drinking water before the earthquake. And of course, of course it was, they had even less afterwards. The people who had more water security, you won't believe this, were the people in the, the camps who were having water delivered to them. So they were actually safer in the earthquake zone than out in rural Haiti where we were, which is where it spread so quickly. So this is another example and some of you will end up studying this uh, here at the university. Um, this being you know, challenges that range from water security to food security, um, global health, international relations. All of this is mixed up in this very uh, difficult uh, situation. All, and all the knowledge that we could bring to this, we still need to bring it to bear on problems like this. Um, but they're really, this, this metaphor of acute and chronic is not a bad one. This is another acute on problem, chronic problem. Cholera is a symptom of Haiti's chronic water insecurity. And, uh, and there'll be others if we can't uh, uh, pull together the resources and commitment to address this. Obviously, again, this has to be done with um, the Haitian people and their, their leadership and through accompaniment. But it's a big task before us. So just to close on, a, on an upbeat note, because I mean, again, our experience has been very good. One of the things that we had plan to do prior to the earthquake was to build another community hospital in this town of Mirabale. Remember I told you about going there in 1983, working in this terrible clinic that was run by my friends and co-workers who are still my friends and co-workers, and having this dream, really 27, 28 years ago, of what it might look like in that town to have a really proper medical center. And after the earthquake, we were encouraged by the Haitian Ministry of Health, which by then, of course, is operating out of a tent or a trailer somewhere since the Ministry of Health was destroyed in the earthquake. But the, that didn't mean all the personnel died. They didn't. They were still there. Some of them did, of course, a very large number of them. But they said, you know, really, we, if you're going to talk about building back better, let's make it more than a slogan. Let's make an ambitious teaching hospital in this town. And so we went back. We had volunteer architects. Actually, uh, someone I went to college with at, at Duke who became an architect, she and her husband uh, worked together on this project to design it. And, uh, uh, and you know, a, a construction guy in Boston, I say construction guy, I don't know what to say. The guy, a, a man who built up a big construction company uh, in Boston and then sold it. Um, he has been down there almost nonstop since the earthquake. His name's Jim Ansara. My own, my former student, who I mentioned, the doctor of this guy. Uh, by the way, Joseph, I didn't really describe how he was funny, too. One day I took those pictures. I said to him, can I use your pictures in public speaking? He said, sure. And I said, uh, can I send them you know, elsewhere, and can I publish them? He said, yes, you can. So my best friend, who's from Muscatine or Muscatine? So, sorry. My best friend from Muscatine, who knows who he is and what he does now? Jim Kim is the president of Dartmouth. Um, he was that year, he and I went to school together in, in Boston, and he was, 20 years later, he's at the World Health Organization, and, I, and he was running the HIV AIDS program for the World Health Organization. And I sent him those pictures of Joseph, right, before and after. And he put them into this really glossy publication and sent it to me from Geneva. And I said, well, I'll give this to, to Joseph. So I brought it to Joseph. And I, I gave it to him. And he opened it up and looked at it and said, yeah, I'm a star. <laughs> anyway, um, 
So this is that same doctor who then was a fifth year medical student. Now I said he's a faculty member at Harvard, the guy from Chicago, not Muscatine Teen. Don't tell him I said this, please. Um, so uh, David Walton, the Chicago guy, is, is the program lead on this massive endeavor, uh, uh, which is, um, and I, I was saying last night in the unnameable city with the unnameable Hawkeye team, the, uh, you know, there's a lot of plans and charrettes. I didn't even know what a charrette was, you know, mock-ups, architectural drawings, models. There are a million in, in Haiti, or not in Haiti, but made for Haiti. But they're not, the program, they're not getting built. And you, know, you don't want to discourage people from dreaming about how to help Haiti and imagining. But the real problems in Haiti are implementation, as I said. It's not that there's a shortage of ideas. It's a shortage of action and proper implementation, and also integration of different groups, um, different actors. There are thousands and thousands of NGOs. And finding a way to add up to more than some of our parts, I think, is a big challenge for all of us. And most of you here are Americans, but it's a big challenge for the, us Americans, I think, about figuring out how to help Haiti more effectively, how to coordinate our efforts. This uh, is not just a charrette. This is, I was there last week. This is a hospital that's going up according to plan. And uh, uh, that tile was already laid. Uh, this is a um, and the, the plan is to open part of this hospital um, in January on the second year, two year, on or around the second year anniversary. It doesn't matter to me exactly when it's launched. What I can promise you is that this hospital will be done. And it will be staffed by Haitians, but it's going to require a lot more than any other activity that we've been involved with um, as partners in health. Uh, this is the largest project we've ever been involved with. We, uh, try to obviously it's a it's a who's going to own this hospital who already owns it the Ministry of Health so this is owned lock stock and barrel as we build it by the Haitian people um, and it's required so many partners to get going but I think it's going to not only create a lot of jobs transfer new skills in building it it's also going to provide the uh, the best care in Haiti and be a, a, a site for training so that I I am um, I want to as I started by giving the example of, of Joseph, the, the before and after of an individual, then going to the before and after of institutions like a hospital. I do, I do want to show you one last image, which is, uh, is uh, a woman who I met because of the earthquake. Um, this is uh, Carmen. I lost, you know, this, this, I'm, I'm going to get her age wrong, but I think probably about 20. Um, lost both of her uh, feet and, and le uh, lower legs in, in the earthquake. And one of the things that I have learned uh, again from the Haitian people, I know this is a cliche when people talk about the resilience of people, but I have learned a lot. And this is she and many others who have recovered. This is the same girl with her prostheses have, have really taught me a lot. And I intend to keep learning in Haiti and trying to share what I learned with others and keep this, again, this feedback loop going. And I'm here tonight also to have a conversation and learn with you. So thank you very much. And I look forward to opening this up to discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And no one is allowed to leave. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. You are allowed to leave. I've sealed the exits. So who wants to start the Q&A? And maybe we can have the lights up fully now. Or... Yes. We have a mic. Do we have mics? Yes. Mics on the side aisles. The mics are on either side. Go ahead and come in. Go ahead and what? I do what Claire says. So if anyone wants to ask a question, you should come to the microphones that are on the aisles right here. Hi, Dr. Farmer. This is uh, I'm Dr. Shah from uh, Des Moines University in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, during your talk, you mentioned about an emphasis on building systems, and I, I totally agree. And during my fellowship at uh, Mayo Clinic, we used to talk about that Mayo Clinic is world famous and world renowned 
because of the systems it has already built. So the question I have for you is, how do you build systems in countries and cultures which are not used to having any systems? And, and it, once you build the system in healthcare, how do you sustain them when the rest of their life is not around systems? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think that uh, leaving aside the Mayo Clinic, one of the biggest problems in American medicine is also a lack of systems thinking and good systems. And we need to, uh, feel free to applaud, I like that. We, we, need, we need to apply uh, such thinking here as well. Um, you know, I, I work in uh, a giant teaching hospital uh, in Boston, which is, provides some of the best care that I've seen in patient care. But again, in the shadows of these big teaching hospitals are people who fall through the safety net, such as it is, and it's better in Massachusetts than some places. So I, I, I do believe that what I'm about to say holds true for... Uh, for the United States as well. I'll just give one example. What we, it, I think it less than culture, it really is about country. You know, it's really about, because American culture is very strange too. Have you ever been to California? It's a little joke. Thank you for those of you who are laughing at my jokes. Um, now, what I really mean is, and any anthropologist would tell you, of course, is that, you know, cultural, uh, culture exists everywhere. Um, and. Uh, Haiti's no exception. So what we've done is spend a lot less time focusing on people's beliefs about healthcare or ideology and building those systems, and that's been the right thing to do for us. Um, what we've tried to do is to build, you ask how to do this in a place where there's nothing, in a way it's easier, because if there's, if you go to rural Rwanda and there's a, no hospital there and the, the Ministry of Health says, why don't you build a hospital here? What we've done is try to work to link these hospitals to health centers, Right, which uh, the Mayo Clinic does as well, but also something I've, we've done better in Haiti than the United States is link them, link these institutions, the hospitals and health centers, to families, to villages through community health workers. Now, in the United States, as you know, because you, this is your field, people talk about medical home, right? The medical home. They still don't mean the home. What we mean in Haiti is we're really going to link the people in their home to the health center, to the hospital. I mean, and that's been kind of our model, as simple as it is, everywhere we've worked. I think we should do that better in the United States, too. So what we did, some people call this reverse innovation. When we saw that we had patients in Haiti on treatment for AIDS, for example, doing better than some of the patients we saw in the United States, we tried to take the Haiti model and bring it to Boston. Community health workers, to, you know, vi regularly visiting uh, patients with chronic disease. Now, I got into a little trouble at Boston saying, all we're trying to do is raise Harvard levels of care up to Haiti levels. That, that it didn't go over well in, in Boston. But it, it, it did, we proved by using all kinds of metrics that we could uh, find in the United States easily that we could measure that this was a, a, a way to improve the, quali you know, the quality of their, of their care and, and, of course, their lives uh, and prevent opportunistic infections in, in, the, in these patients, but the same would be true for diabetes or major mental Ill illness. So that's the basic model. There's nothing uh, complicated about it to link village or home to health center. You don't need to go to a hospital for most problems to uh, robust hospitals. We, Partners Health, just to give you an idea of the scope, which Partners Health runs, I think, about 60 uh, hospitals in the world, most of them public facilities, most of them in Africa and in Haiti. Thank you. Questions on oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Evening, Dr. Farmer. Hello. Really appreciate um, you being here this evening. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, you discussed um, the training that the organization um, that you helped to uh, create um, provides to um, a number of individuals. Um, I'm just wondering what that training consists of, um, what type of education um, those individuals are receiving in order to go out into the community and actually provide health care to um, the local uh, people? Yes, and thank you very much. So the training, the, the three main components of what we do, as I mentioned, direct, direct delivery of services, training, and then uh, and that feedback loop of research. Obviously, sometimes you have to build healthcare infrastructure to provide the services, but those are the main three pillars, research, training, and service. The training varies, of course, on what we're trying to convey. For a community health worker, the curriculum is very different from 
uh, you know, a nurse anesthetist curriculum or what we're trying to do in training physicians is very different uh, than starting a residency program. We're, we're actually working at all those levels and trying more and more to formalize our curriculum. We've done that a lot with community health workers, you know, with some variation from site to site, for example, Haiti to Rwanda, but really trying to um, have formalized curricula. Those are all posted online, by the way. Um, as I mentioned uh, in referring to the med student I met yesterday, she found these materials in Mozambique that we developed in Haiti and Rwanda and elsewhere. So you should um, take a look at those if you're interested. Um, but the broader, uh, the broader commitment is to training and to continually improving the quality of the training that we do. And uh, we're now developing more nursing modules, modules for uh, social medicine targeted towards physicians, public health modules. Uh, and we're also, of course, I teach at Harvard, and I'm trying to make sure that the ma materials that we use there at Harvard are also available to our colleagues in Africa and elsewhere in the world. And the university has been very supportive of that, Harvard University has. There's not a long tradition of making such materials open, open source, but they've been very supportive of, of Partners in Health and our academic efforts to do so. So I, I hope that all of the materials that we um, develop will be op open source. Thank you. Dr. Farmer, um, I have two questions for you. One is about finance. Um, I want to know how you have been able to control the disbursement in Haiti. Um, I was there in 1976, and we were talking about uh, funding, and uh, we were told that when a road, a road was built, it started this big and always ended up this big because the material uh, and the money ended up in somewhere else. So how have you been able to manage that? And my second question is going to be, is France providing funding? Because obviously a lot of the state uh, that Haiti is in has been caused uh, when the French uh, pulled out and the cost of pulling out. Yeah. Two good questions. Um, I personally have no experience with large infrastructure pro programs like roads. So the road, uh, but I will say one thing, uh, that, that the road that I just drove this week from Conge, Central Haiti, to Port-au-Prince used to take three or four hours. It's an hour and 45 minutes, it's paved the whole way. So I don't know how many, maybe, the, maybe a lot of that money was wasted or misappropriated, I don't know. Um, but it, the road is there, thank God. And what you described from 19, in the 70s and on has happened again and again. And I don't really know the answer to that question. What I said last night when I had a similar question was, I think that we have to be committed. If you have an accompaniment model that I mentioned earlier to accompany, say, the Ministry of Public Works, that would be the, the, you know, that would be the relevant ministry in Haiti. How much of this stuff is really being stolen? How much of this stuff is really, they really just don't have the infrastructure of transparency to monitoring it? I don't know what the answer is. That's not a rhetorical question. That's a real, genuine question. My experience is largely with the Ministry of Health. And um, we, you asked about how we do disbursement. So the salary, and I'll give a very uh, brass tax answer. The salary disbursements we make, after all, one of our biggest concerns has been to create jobs for Haitians, not to have overhead for partners in health. So the salary disbursements are made directly to the employees. Um, we also um, try to make sure, you know, Paul Collier uh, is an economist from Oxford, and I, I just was reading on the, here today in Ames, he wrote a not an uncharitable uh, review of, of uh, the book that I wrote um, in, uh, in the current issue of Foreign Affairs, and I just read it today. And he uses, used this term uh, of independent service providers. By that he means groups like ours, NGOs. But you can be an independent service provider that is committed to accompanying and strengthening the Haitian government, whether at the national or district level, and that's what we're trying to do. So again, all these hospitals we're building are public hospitals. We have a mix of public and private employees. That works much better so far in Rwanda, but I think it's the right model for Haiti too. In Rwanda, when we built a hospital, we built three hospitals with them, in one of them in northern in Rwanda, it cost uh, over $4 million, which is not a lot of money for such a beautiful hospital. But the Rwandan government equipped it completely with $1.5 million worth of equipment. And they're also providing something that you can imagine what it is, is staff. So that's kind of the dream 
Um, and we're moving toward that dream in Haiti by helping to provide this infrastructure of transparency, which is what? It's, you know, bookkeepers, computers, electricity. The thing, that's what I meant by platform or infrastructure of transparency. And, you know, you got to, I guess what I'm saying is if you don't try, then you're just going to have, again, more and more NGOs doing their own thing, which is not a bad thing, but if there's 10,000 of them and Haiti looks as it does today, uh, it's clear that we can do, do more and do better. The, the, the second, what was the second question? Just a one word. Point. When did they, when uh, France uh, pulled out? Oh, yeah, it's out. a great question. Uh, I'm afraid to answer, you know, the question. Are there any, any French people here? French well, Canadian. I, well, listen, if you're French Canadian, I feel safe then. <laughs> um, I, I will just say this. First of all, France is um, contributing to reconstruction. Um, I, but I think it's, it's important to note that uh, when the Haitian government pointed out that France had extorted a great deal of money from Haiti between 1804 into the 20th century, uh, the response was very hostile from France, which I thought was just way too much. I mean, this is one of the most powerful countries in the world and one of the poorest. Um, it was unpleasant to watch, I'll, I'll put it that way. And I don't like saying it here or in France because it sounds like I'm, you know, uh, insulting. That's not my intention at all. It's a historical point of fact, as you, as you suggested. And I think, I don't care what the term is, but I think, you know, some of the money that France extorted after the revolution in 1804, uh, I it, would be, it would be good to put it back into Haiti. You know, is that okay to say? Evidently, the French didn't like it. Now, um, I, I have said this directly to, the, to I, a friend of mine who is a doctor, was in a very high-ranking position in France. Those of you who are studious can figure out who this is and what he did. But... Uh, you know, and, and it, it's you know probably the best way to do this is to, is through personal diplomacy. The Haitians should, uh, obviously should do it that way, but you know m rather than maybe writing a book about how um, how important it would be to think about returning those funds, you know, to try and get uh, the French government to, to to you know contribute meaningfully to reconstruction, which I believe they intend to do. The American government and the French government together committed to rebuild the General Hospital, which is a very ambitious project, uh, thought to be around $50 million. I haven't seen that project start yet, but I don't doubt that both the American and, and the French governments, I don't doubt that they meant that and mean it, I don't, but I don't think it started. And I'd like to see it start. I think it would be a great symbol of partnership uh, and also get at the historical uh, uh, truth that you mentioned. Thank you. So keep, let's, keep, let's watch and see what happens. Thank you for your discussion, Dr. Farmer. Uh, you Thank talked you. about the impact of water insecurity. Yeah. I was wondering what your perspective is on food insecurity in yeah. Haiti and how that relates to the deforestation. And also historically, is the deforestation an issue of uh, cook fire fuel or animal agriculture or uh, what's the cause and is that going to provide some solution understanding that better? Well, you know, I, I think that uh, I can give a short answer that's not expert on the cause of it. A lot of it has been for cooking fuel um, and some of it, I, I mean, I, I found out that among the top three causes, you know, are ut utilizations of charcoal uh, were, to my surprise, dry cleaning and bakeries. I didn't know that. I would have guessed it was mostly cooking fuel. Uh, and it may be mostly, meaning more than 50% for the charcoal, but it's a very substantial amount of other endeavors, including, as you mentioned, uh, large, larger scale irrigation, uh, larger scale uh, deforestation, but that's been mostly in the lowlands, right? In the hills, it's been small, uh, small, uh, smaller scale and really to plant food crops and also to, to again, to harvest trees for charcoal. Now, how to, how to respond to that? I've spent the last couple of years trying to learn from others who know a lot about this. Um, also, I have to say, I've learned a lot from President Clinton. Um, and one of the things that is clear to me is that you can't, just by fiat, tell people to stop making charcoal, which, you know, um, 
that has been done before. You also have to think of alternative fuels. And I don't know what those should be, but they have to be on a large enough scale so that at the same time that you say, hey, you can't cut down these trees, you know, that, and, and even as you're reforesting, as we did in that area around Conj. What else did we do at the same time? Of course, we provided a huge number of jobs in healthcare and education. So the idea that you can just vertically implement one thing, like reforestation, hasn't worked in Haiti. There have been hundreds of millions of dollars spent studying the problem. As I have friends and acquaintances who have been consultants and done two-year-long studies and in the 70s, 80s, 90s. It's not a lack of understanding the problem, nor is it a lack of uh, reforestation efforts. It's a lack of reforestation efforts that are linked to other endeavors that can increase the crop yield at the same time that you're reforesting. And I, I am convinced that there are adequate solutions, but the implementation has to be um, linked up to implementing other endeavors, alternative fuel source. I mean, for example, in the Dominican Republic, um, when uh, it became, in a way, illegal to harvest charcoal, first of all, they, they just started selling it across the border, as you can imagine. But there was also a campaign to put pro liquid propane cook stoves, make them available to poor people in the Dominican Republic. There has to be something ambitious like that. And I would also add that the amount of money pledged to rebuild Haiti, which is in the billions of dollars, um, I'm convinced that you could, you know, that the capital exists not just in the world, of course it exists in the world, but the capital exists in terms of pledges. But we need ambitious and integrated projects uh, to make those work. And, um, you know, I, I, again, I have some friends who have studied this problem for a long time. Uh, and have, have taught me some of the things that I just said about where, you know, where's the charcoal going. Uh, but they've also, they're also convinced it could be fixed. The technical solutions exist. Implementation and integration are the two biggest problems. Implementation and integration. And, you know, right now, if you look at development work, it's very splintered, right? The water people do water. The food people do fee uh, food. The health people do health. The microfinance people do microfinance, et cetera, et cetera. It's very splintered. But the, the integrated development, and there are people in this university who work on integrated develop, agriculture and development projects, that's really the approach that we're going to need in Haiti. Uh, and and I, I'm hoping that it's moving forward and not back, this integrated project, integrated approach. Thank you. Before our last few questions, we're going to be able to take two or three more questions. I want to remind everyone that there is a reception downstairs afterwards with a book signing. So. We'll take two or three more questions. Sure, let's take three. Three. He wants I'll try three. to make my okay. <laughs> answers shorter. Hello, uh, my name is Eric. I'm studying environmental science here. And to preface my question, um, I had the great opportunity last semester to study abroad in Peru, yeah. and where my uh, world of agriculture was expanded incredibly, just seeing how they've been farming for hundreds of years and where the farm of a land 500 years ago, or they were farming more land 500 years ago than what is today. Yeah. So I'm curious to know what agricultural programs you're a part of through your organization or your affiliates um, for, of course, what is the... Is pretty much all of it in Haiti is imported. Probably comes from Iowa. And when we started saying, okay, can't we think of some way to... You, you, I don't, I'm sure all of you know what RUTF is, especially freshmen. Ready to use therapeutic food. Duh. I'm kidding. You shouldn't know that. But you know, there, there's a way to treat malnutrition, as maybe you know, um, with basically peanut butter or some other, you know, some other similar vitamin-rich uh, paste. And that gets called ready to use, it's called ready to use therapeutic food. I found out that when we started growing the peanuts for this locally, that it was one of the first projects supported by a, a group to which I'm very grateful, a very large group has been helping fund it. But they, all of their other food that they were using in programs was imported. So, I mean, that's just an example. Now, our agricultural uh, endeavors, we, we have uh, inside our affiliates, to use your word, uh, of, of partners in agriculture as well. And we did, we, in Haiti, it's more, more advanced. We have a, we have a farm. You know, uh, we work with lots of farmers. We also try to link interventions like that to families with children with malnutrition. 
And then they go, and this, we do this in Rwanda too, then they go to the home and say, hey, much, how much land do you have? How could you manage this better? So we have a lot of endeavors like that. They're probably described pretty well on the, on the internet. Emily, I don't know if, if not, not if you, I think they're probably described on the Partners in Health website, which is just, remember, PIH. Um, but I would say that, yes, we could put a lot more of our energies into that, but I would really rather find other partner organizations with more experience in food security. Um, and, and also, you know, keeping our endeavors growing and robust, but also to keep finding more people. Again, Partners in Health was founded to look for partnerships. And there are so many groups in Haiti. I wish we could almost, in, you know, make sure that in every site we work, we also had a food security partner um, that was, you know, not, that was really willing to embrace uh, the challenges and call on expertise the way we do in healthcare. Uh, one last little example, and I don't want to drag this out, is uh, solar power. I mean, we didn't want to have to build partners in solar power. We wanted to find an organization that would help us solarize our facilities, and we did, called Solar Electric Light Fund. And um, the, the implementer uh, was an American uh, who had worked everywhere from the Amazon all over the world, is a real solar power enthusiast. He worked with us in Rwanda, Lesotho, Burundi, and Haiti, but he died in the earthquake. And, you know, that, of course, slowed down our work, but I, I just did a, last week, this week in Haiti, I just did a, a piece with them about the, their efforts in Bukan Kare, which is completely solarized now. So anyway, that's a, wending my way from food security, a huge problem, to local procurement, one of the goals of accompaniment approach to partnership, another part of accompaniment. Uh, and I hope that, you know, um, it, you know, offers some idea of what we're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, I was wondering, I know when I talk to a lot of people that I know about advocacy or um, doing charity work, they feel like they can't just make a difference because they're just one person. And yeah. I know that, that what you have done clearly shows that one person can make a difference. So. I was wondering what ideas you had for people to help just as individuals or as small groups abroad and in their local communities because, like you said, even local is global. Yeah. We are part of the globe. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I think there's a good opportunity for me to, to say that one person can make a difference only if he or she is working with others. So that may sound like a, a non-response, but um, I'm very... Uh, convinced that partnership uh, is, is key to this. And you know, you, you probably, I mean, as an anthropologist, and I'm, I, it's been 25 years since I was in graduate school, but you know, you, you learn about the way that uh, culture shapes our notion of the individual. And it's different from place to place. Inside a big complex country like the United States, it's different from town to town. Um, but the communitarian ethos you know, the idea that you're always going to work is in partnership is different from an individualistic one, I think you'll agree. And I'm going to come down as strongly as possible on the side of working with teams of people. And let me give the example again of a patient like Joseph. Um, Joseph, um, yes, he had people like David or the Haitian, ha David's Haitian colleagues, and yours truly, um, take care of him. But we're not the people who are providing the long-term care. That's a community health worker. So if you look at the team that took care of him, again, back to Dr. Shaw's point about systems and the Mayo Clinic, we try to set up a system that will work not just for him, but for thousands and thousands, and in fact, hundreds of thousands of patients and have, that involves a team in every instance of nurses, doctors, community health workers, pharmacy experts, Again, back to the question about in the infrastructure or the comments about transparency. And, you know, we, we've had to train managers and learn from managers, train people who could do electronic medical records, pharmacy procurement, et cetera. So, yes, an individual can make a difference, and the best way to do that is as a member of a team. Now, if you're an artist, a painter, or a, an athlete who does some, you know, a, a individual javelin throw or something, you, I guess you don't need a team to throw a javelin. That could be pretty ugly. Um, <laughs> But, you know, you guys are all football nuts, I'm told. Um, you know, the t it's, this, this kind of work is a team sport. It really is. It's a team sport. 
Thank you very much. Where? Over there. And by the way, I'm not rushing away. I'm going down. I'm, I'm going to, yes, I hope to see you. There'll be time for questions downstairs. OK. Which way, which way do I look to? This way or that way? Hi. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Farmer, for thank coming you. to talk with us. Um, one question I did have, you've mentioned all these hardships that your organization has had to deal with. Um, I did? Yes. <laughs> did I? A couple. Um, one thing I would like to ask, uh, what are some hardships your organization has uh, encountered internally? Yeah. Um, setbacks and yeah. or f um, I'm just wondering how you dealt with them and how you continue to deal with those. Uh, <coughs> thank you. That, that's a great question. Um, I think that given how large our organization is, 13, 14,000 people, given that it spreads from a research university to poor villages across uh, a dozen countries to prisons in Siberia to poorer countries of the, uh, parts of the United States, Given that it spreads through that geographic distance and such bizarrely diverse worlds or different worlds, I think we have a fairly limited amount of internal uh, strife. But, but the earthquake has been a very difficult um, challenge to all of us. Uh, the Haiti teams especially, of course, those who lost friends and family, you know, a as I did and, and everybody who's really tightly tied to Haiti. That was uh, very difficult, but also the, the rapid growth. So this is a very specific answer to your question. The rapid growth of the organization has been extremely stressful. Now, what are the alternatives to not growing rapidly? Not growing at all? Shrinking? That would mean, of course, that we can offer our services to fewer and fewer people. So the cost has been high, um, which is, you know, disagreement, um, some discord, I wouldn't call it strife, but a lot of tension and stress. Um, the costs have been high, but the yield has been higher, I believe. That is the yield of, from this rapid growth. And I'll just give you one last number, and then we can pick it up downstairs. Um, we, <clears throat> Partners in Health probably had, on the eve of the earthquake, about 20,000 regular supporters. That's pretty, pretty good, but we'd been around 20 years, you know, and so... It's not that many. The, by the month after the earthquake, we had 200,000 200, new supporters. And that's a great thing, right? You know, people from Iowa, too, you know, sent money to Partners in Health. And uh, assuming, and I hope correctly, that we could do a good job with the resources that we had to respond to a lot of terrible suffering. And we did do a good job, and we're still trying to do a good job. But don't think for a minute that that was an easy thing to do. So you said that I spoke about the, the hardships we face. I didn't mean to put it that way, but you're right. They have been hardships. Just being a spectator to some of these things is not easy, as you can imagine. I'm sure you can all imagine this, uh, just as I could imagine it. I could imagine it, but I had never been through it. And being that close to that kind of suffering is a very difficult thing to do. But again, although the costs have been high, the reward has been even higher. And again, part of the reward is getting to come to a place like Ames, Iowa, and meet people like you, and to know that in this room, there are not only many supporters of our work, but there are also people who, as Abhishek said in introducing me, who are ready to take the challenge and take up uh, the next generation of efforts that we'll need to respond to some of these very complex problems. So thank you all for having me, and I look forward to seeing you downstairs. Please all join me in thanking Dr. Farmer once again for taking time out of his busy schedule to share his experiences with us. And thanks to all of you for uh, being with us here tonight. Uh, before we go downstairs, two quick, quick announcements. Uh, for those of you who wish to know more about Partners for Health and what you can do to help, they do have a comprehensive website, as Dr. Farmer mentioned, at PIH.org. It does include a secure online donation page that perhaps Dr. Farmer's comments has inspired you to visit. Uh, this information will also be posted on our website, lectures.iastate.edu, if you choose to go there. 
And as we've been mentioning, there is a book reception downstairs. The University Bookstore does have copies of Dr. Farmer's books available for autographing. It is in the Celebrity Cafe. And we invite you all to please come and join us. There will be snacks and reception and a chance for further conversation. Uh, thank you all once again, and we hope to see you next time.